this is chapter 38 of Laura Hillenbrand's Unbroken. Chapter 37, uh, you might remember, has Louis really kind of descending into his PTSD. He's having a lot of flashbacks. He's drinking a lot. He accidentally attacked Cynthia in the night, thinking that he was fighting the bird in his nightmare. Um, he's hit Cynthia. It's getting really, really toxic in their home. Um, and then Cynthia, his wife, had a baby, little Cynthia. Um, but it was just too much for them to handle. So wife Cynthia took baby Cynthia and moved back in with her parents and filed for divorce. So Louis kind of on his own and things are not in a good situation. Which brings us to chapter 38, which is called A Beckoning Whistle. This is on page 375, if you're following along in your own book. Let me adjust our document camera just to go. Here we go. Oh, and hello, this is important. At the end of chapter 37, uh, right as the chapter ends, we find out that the bird's mother, Shizuka, is looking out the window and sees her son, sees the bird, who is hypothetically dead, but turns out he's still alive. There we go. Poor Shizuka Watanabe, the moment when she saw her son must have answered a desperate hope. Two years earlier, she'd been driven up a mountain to see a dead man who looked just like Matsuhiro. Everyone, even her relatives, had believed it was he, and the newspapers had announced Matsuhiro's suicide. But Shizuka had felt a trace of doubt. Perhaps she'd registered the same sensation that Louise Zamperini had felt when Louis was missing. A maternal murmur that told her that her son was still alive. She apparently said nothing of her doubts in public, but in secret, she clung to a promise that Matsuhiro had made when he had last seen her in Tokyo in the summer of 46. On October 1st, 1948, at 7 p.m., he tried to meet her at a restaurant in the Shinjuku district of Tokyo. While she waited for that day, others began to question whether Matsuhiro was really dead. Some looked up the serial number on his army sidearm and found that it was different from that of the gun found beside the body. Matsuhiro could easily have used another weapon, but an examination of the body had also found some features that seemed different from those of the fugitive. The detectives couldn't rule out Watanabe as the dead man, but they couldn't confirm definitively or without doubt that it was he. The search for him resumed, and the police descended again on the Watanabes. Tailed almost everywhere she went, her mail searched, her friends and family interrogated or questioned. Suzuka in endured intense scrutiny for two years, so they're watching her really closely and questioning her for two years. When October 1st, 1948 came, she went to the restaurant, apparently eluding or getting away from her pursuers. There was her son, a living ghost. The sight of him brought her as much fear as joy. She knew that in appearing in public, standing in full view of crowds of people who had surely heard all of the, or excuse me, had heard of the manhunt for him, he was taking a huge risk. She spoke to him for only a few minutes, standing very close to him, trying to restrain the excitement in her voice. Matsuhiro, his face grave, questioned her about the police's tactics. He told her nothing about where he was living or what he was doing. Concerned that they would attract attention, mother and son decided to part. Matsuhiro said that he'd see her again in two years, and then slipped out the door. The police didn't know of the meeting and continued to stalk Shizuka and her children. Everyone who visited them was tailed and investigated. Each time Shizuka ran errands, detectives trailed behind her. After she left each business, they went in to question those who had dealt with her. Shizuka was frequently interrogated, but she answered questions about her son's whereabouts by referring to the suicides on Mount Mitsumine. More than a year passed. Shizuka heard nothing from her son, and the detectives found nothing. Everywhere, there were rumors about his fate. In one, he had fled across the China Sea and disappeared in Manchuria. One had him shot by American GIs. Another had him being struck and killed by a train after an American soldier tied him to the track. But the most persistent stories ended in his suicide by gunshot at the Harakiri in front of the Emperor's Palace by a leap into a volcano. For nearly everyone who had known him, there was only one plausible conclusion to draw from the failure of the massive search. Whether Shizuka believed these rumors is unknown, but in his last meeting with her, Mitsuhiro had given her one very troubling clue. I will meet you in two years, he had said, if I am alive. 
In the second week of September 1949, an angular young man climbed down from a transcontinental train and stepped into Los Angeles. His remarkably tall blonde hair fluttered on the summit of a remarkably tall head, which in turn topped a remarkably tall body. He had a direct gaze. He looks right at you, a stern jawline, and a southern sway in his voice. The product was a the product of a childhood spent on a North Carolina dairy farm. His name was Billy Graham. And if you're not familiar with Billy Graham, he's a very famous uh, preacher. He would go around, he's a Christian preacher, and he would spread his message in these big arenas about this time. At 31, Graham was the youngest college president in America, manning the helm at Northwestern Schools, a small Christian Bible school, liberal arts college, and seminary in Minneapolis. He was also the vice president of Youth for Christ International, an evangelical organization. He'd been crisscrossing the world for years, plugging his faith. The results had been mixed. His last campaign in the Pennsylvania town of Altoona had met with heckling, meager attendance, and a hollering, deranged choir member who had to be thrown out of his services, only to return repeatedly like a fly to spilled jelly. That September, in a vacant parking lot on the corner of Washington Boulevard, Boulevard and Hill Street in Los Angeles, Graham and his small team threw up a 480-foot-long circus tent, set out 6,500 folding chairs, poured down acres of sawdust, hammered together a stage the size of a fairly spacious backyard, and stood an enormous replica of an open Bible in front of it. They held a press conference to announce a three-week campaign to bring Los Angeles, Los Angelinos, there we go, the people of Los Angeles, to Christ. Not a single newspaper story followed, so they're not getting great press. At first, Graham preached to a half-empty tent, but his blunt, emphatic sermons got people talking. By October 16th, the day on which he intended to close the campaign, attendance was high and growing. Graham and his team decided to keep it going. Then newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst reportedly issued a two-word order to his editors, Huff Graham. Overnight, Graham had adoring press coverage and 10,000 people packing into his tent every night. So as soon as the newspaper gets talking about Billy Graham and he's had some success, people are talking about his sermons, all of a sudden, everybody's packing the tent. Organizers expanded the tent and piled in several thousand more chairs, but it was still so overcrowded that hundreds of people had to stand in the street straining to hear Graham over the traffic. Film moguls, seeing leading man material, offered Graham a movie contract. Graham burst out laughing and told them he wouldn't do it for a million bucks a month. In a city that wasn't bashful about sinning, Graham had kicked off a religious revival. And a revival means like, just like you would revive someone and they'd come back to life. It's that same idea. People are uh, coming to the religion. Louis knew nothing of Graham. Four years after returning from the war, he was still in the Hollywood apartment, lost in alcohol and plans to murder the bird. Cynthia had returned from Florida, but was staying only until she could arrange a divorce. The two lived on a, they lived on in a grim coexistence, each one out of answers. One day that October, Cynthia and Louie were walking down the hallway in their building when a new tenant and his girlfriend came out of an apartment. The two couples began chatting, and it was at first a pleasant conversation. Then the man mentioned that an evangelist named Billy Graham was preaching downtown. Louis turned abruptly and walked away. Remember, Louis had forbidden Cynthia to go to church. That was part of his kind of paranoia during this time. Cynthia stayed in the hall listening to the neighbor. When she returned to the apartment, she told Louis that she wanted him to take her to hear Graham speak. Louis refused. Cynthia went alone. She came home a light like lighter, lifted, uh, buoyant. She's feeling energized and hopeful. She found Louis and told him that, he, that she wasn't going to divorce him. The news filled Louis with relief, but when Cynthia said she'd experienced a religious awakening, he was appalled, shocked in a bad way. Louis and Cynthia went to dinner at Sylvia and Harvey's house. In the kitchen after the meal, Cynthia spoke of her experience in Graham's tent and said that she wanted Louis to go listen to him. Louis soured and said he absolutely wouldn't go. The argument continued through the evening and into the next day. Cynthia recruited the new neighbor, and together they badgered Louis. For several days, Louis kept refusing and began trying to dodge his wife and the neighbor until Graham left town. 
Then Graham's run was extended, and Cynthia leavened her entreaties with a lie. Louis was fascinated with science, so she told him that Graham's sermons discussed science at length. It was just enough incentive to tip the balance. Louis gave in. Billy Graham was wearing out. For many hours a day, seven days a week, he preached to vast throngs of huge groups, and each sermon was a workout delivered in a booming voice punctuated with broad gestures of the hands, arms, and body. He got up as early as five and stayed in the tent late into the night, counseling troubled souls. He was super busy all day, every day. Graham's weight was dropping, and dark semicircles shadowed his eyes. At times, he felt that if he stopped moving, his legs would buckle, so he took to pacing his pulpit to keep himself from keeling over. Once, someone brought a baby to him, and he asked whose child she was. He'd been away from home for so long that he didn't recognize his own daughter. He longed to end the campaign, but the, sex, the success of it made him sure that Providence or God had other wishes. When Louis and Cynthia entered the tent, Louis refused to go farther forward than the back rows. He sat down sullen, so he's pouting. He would wait out his sermon and go home and be done with it. The tent was hushed. From someplace outside came a high beckoning sound. Louis had known that sound since his boyhood when he'd lain awake beside Pete, yearning to escape. It was the whistle of a train. When Graham appeared, Louis was surprised. He'd expected the sort of frothy, holy rolling charlatan that he'd seen preaching near Torrance when he was a boy. What he saw instead was a brisk, neatly groomed man two years younger than himself. Though he was nursing a sore throat and asked that his amplifier be turned up to save his voice, Graham showed no other sign of his fatigue or exhaustion or tiredness. He asked his listeners to open their Bibles to the 8th chapter of John. And so this is from the 8th chapter of John. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again in the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought, him, brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, or um, like sleeping with another person who's not her husband. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman has taken an adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commands us that such should be stoned, which is killing someone by throwing stones at them. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, the woman standing in the midst. Now, even if you're not familiar with this religious text, this is a fairly famous story um, in which there's a woman who was sleeping around, she gets caught. The law says that if you're doing that, um, you'll be killed by having rocks thrown at you. Um, and so Jesus just starts to write stuff in the dirt. And he says, you know, any of you that have never made a, never made a mistake before, you get to throw the first stone. And one by one, everybody drops their stones and they walk, they walk away. It continues. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw no one but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? So he's saying, where are the people who want to throw rocks at you? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So it's like, look, I'm not mad at you. I'm not blaming you. Just go and fix it. And so remember that as Louis has been going through all of these things, he's made a lot of choices he regrets. And so hearing this story is going to be really powerful for him because he can connect and say, you know, I have a lot of regrets. But can he find a place where there's no condemnation or no blame for his uh, actions? Louis was suddenly wide awake. Describing Jesus rising from his knees after a night of prayer, Graham asked his listeners how long it had been since they'd prayed in earnest or sincerely. Then he focused on Jesus bending down, his finger tracing words in the sand at the Pharisees' feet, sending the men scattering in fear. What did they see Jesus write? Graham asked. Inside himself, Louis felt something twisting. Darkness doesn't hide the eyes of God, Graham said. God takes down your life from the time you were born to the time you die. And when you stand before God on the great judgment day, 
you're going to say, Lord, I wasn't such a bad fellow. And they're going to pull down the screen and they're going to shoot the moving picture of your life from the cradle to the grave. And you're going to hear every thought that was going through your mind every minute of the day, every second of the minute. And you're going to hear the words that you said. And your own words and your own thoughts and your own deeds are going to condemn you or like find you guilty or blame you as you stand before God on that day. And God is going to say, depart from me. Louis felt, felt indignant rage flaring in him, a struck match. So that means he's angry because he feels like this is not fair, this thing they're saying. I am a good man, he thought. I am a good man. Even as he had this thought, he felt the lie in it. He knew what he had become. Somewhere under his anger, there was a lurking, nameless uneasiness. The shudder of sharks rasping their back along the bottom of the raft. There was a thought he must not think, a memory he must not see. With the urgency of a bolting animal, he wanted to run. Graham looked out over his audience. Here tonight was a drowning man, a drowning woman, a drowning man, a drowning boy, a drowning girl that is lost in the sea of life. He told of hell and salvation, men saved and men lost, always coming back to the stooped figure drawing letters in the sand. Louis grew more and more angry and more and more spooked. Every head bowed and every eye, cl eye closed, said Graham, offering a traditional invitation to repentance, a declaration of faith, and absolution. Absolution means uh, freeing yourself of all guilt or like cleansing. Louis grabbed Cynthia's arm, stood up, and bowled his way from the tent. Somewhere in the city, a siren began a low wail. The sound, rising and falling slowly, carried through the tent, picked up by the microphone that was recording the sermon. That night, Louis lay helpless as the belt whipped his head. Remember, he's dreaming of the bird every night. The body that hunched over him was that of the bird. The face was that of the devil. Louis rose from his nightmares to find Cynthia there. All morning Sunday, she tried to coax him into seeing Graham again. Louis, angry and threatened, refused. Remember, he's feeling threatened because he's going, no, I'm a good person. But there's this thing inside of him that's saying that he has some things he needs to fix. And he doesn't want to face that. And so that's where that threat comes in. For several hours, Cynthia and Louis argued. Exhausted by her persistence, Louis finally agreed to go with one caveat or like one clause or understanding or deal. When Graham said every head bowed, every eyes closed, they were leaving. Under the tent that night, Graham spoke of how the world was in an age of war, an age defined by persecution or hurting other people and suffering. Why, Graham asked, is God silent while good men suffer? He began his answer by asking his audience to consider the evening sky. If you look into the heavens tonight, on this beautiful California night, I see the stars and I can see the footprints of God, he said. I think to myself, my father, my heavenly father, hung them there with a flaming fingertip and holds them there with the power of his om omnip omnipotent, sorry, hard to say, that means like all powerful hand. And he runs the whole universe and he's not too busy running the whole universe to count the hairs on my head and see a sparrow when it falls, because God is interested in me. God spoke in creation. Louis was winding tight, so he's getting tense. He remembered the day when he and Phil, slowly dying on the raft, had slid into the doldrums, which was that like weird calm part of the ocean. Above the sky had been a swirl of light. Below, the stilled ocean had mirrored the sky, its clarity broken only by a leaping fish. Odd to silence, forgetting his thirst and his hunger, forgetting that he was dying, Louis had known only gratitude. That day, he had believed that what lay around them was the work of an infinitely broad, so never-ending, benevolent or good hands, a gift of compassion. In the years since, that thought had been lost, right? Which makes sense. He had this moment of believing that there's just goodness and compassion, but then when he survives the prisoner of war camp, he loses that, that sense. Graham went on. He spoke of God reaching into the world through miracles and the intangible blessings that give men the strength to outlast their sorrows. God works miracles one after another, he said. God says, if you suffer, I'll give you the grace to go forward. So he found himself thinking, thinking of the moment at which he had woken in the sinking hole of Green Hornet, the wires that had trapped him a moment earlier now inexplicably gone. 
and he remembered the Japanese bombers swooping over the rafts, riddling them with bullets, and yet not a single bullet had struck him, Phil, or Max. He had fallen into unbearably cruel worlds, and yet he had borne them, right? He had held up, he had sur <coughs> excuse me, survived. When he turned these memories in his mind, the only explanation he could find was one in which the impossible was possible. What God asks of men, said Graham, is faith. His invisibility is the truest test of that faith. To know who sees him, God makes himself unseen. Louis shone with sweat, right? He's like remembering these things on the boat. He's stressed. He felt accused, cornered, pressed by a frantic urge to flee. As Graham asked for heads to bow and eyes to close, Louis stood abruptly and rushed for the street, towing Cynthia behind him. Nobody leaving, said Graham. You can leave while I'm preaching, but not now. Everybody's still and quiet. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. He asked the faithful to come forward. Louis pushed past the congregants in his row, charging for the exit. His mind was tumbling. He felt enraged, violent, on the edge of explosion. He wanted to hit someone. As he reached the aisle, he stopped. Cynthia, the rows of bowed heads, the sawdust underfoot, the tent around him, all disappeared. A memory, long beaten back, the memory from which he had run the evening before, was upon him. Louis was on the raft. There was gentle Phil crumpled up before him, Max breathing skeleton, endless oceans stretching away in every direction, the sun lying over them, the cunning bodies of the sharks waiting, circling. He was a body on a raft, dying of thirst. He felt words whisper from his swollen lips. It was a promise thrown at heaven, a promise he had not kept, a promise he had allowed himself to forget until just this instant. If you will save me, I will serve you forever. And then, standing under a circus tent on a clear night in downtown Los Angeles, Louis felt rain falling. It was the last flashback he would ever have. Louis let go of Cynthia and turned toward Graham. He felt supremely alive. He began walking. This is it, said Graham. God has spoken to you. You come on. Cynthia kept her eyes on Louis all the way home. When they entered the apartment, Louis went straight to his cache of liquor. It was the time of night when he usually, when the need usually took hold of him. But for the first time in years, Louis had no desire to drink. He carried the bottles to the kitchen sink, opened them, and poured their contents into the drain. Then he hurried through the apartment, gathering packs of cigarettes, a secret stash of girly magazines, everything that was part of his ruined years. He heaved it all down the trash chute. In the morning, he woke feeling cleansed. For the first time in five years, the bird hadn't come into his dreams. The bird would never come again. Louis dug up the Bible that had been issued to him by the Air Corps and mailed home to his mother when he was believed dead. He walked to Barnsdale Park, where he and Cynthia had gone in better days, and where Cynthia had gone alone when he'd been on his benders. He found a spot under a tree, sat down, and began reading. Resting in the shade and stillness, Louis felt profound peace. When he thought of his, his, when he thought of his history, what resonated or stuck out and um, seemed important with him now was not all that he had suffered, but the divine love that he believed had intervened or gotten involved to save him. He was not the worthless, broken, forsaken man that the bird had striven to make of him. In a single silent moment, his rage, his fear, his humiliation and helplessness had fallen away. That morning, he believed he was a new creation. Softly, he wept. And it's just an amazing moment for Louis that makes us able to rejoice with the character that he has fought for so long because he had his dignity and his humanity stripped away. But in this moment, he can recognize that there was love throughout his story, and that's what he needs to have his humanity restored. And so for the first time in a very long time, things are looking up for Louis, and we're going to pause right there.